when we um, were told that we had to accept the lockdown, which a lot of people felt very unhappy about and felt that there was not enough evidence for a national lockdown, it was very much on the assumption that we would leave the lockdown and things might have improved. The reality is, is that over 23 million people have now, who had previously been living under tier one, gone into lockdown, have now come out in higher tiers. It feels like perpetual punishment. And even the way we're talking about it, you know, are kind of released from certain uh, uh, restrictions, you know, whether the Prime Minister will allow us and if we buckle down and then we can have Christmas. And the whole discussion around Christmas has been very much, you know, well, we are going to indulge you people who want their Christmas with their families for five days, but you're going to pay for it. And I'm afraid that the problem for me with this whole discussion is that, that we are free... We're supposed to live in a free society, in a democracy, but we're behaving as though we are in a pre-democratic time with some kind of fiefdom announcing and micromanaging exactly what we should do. So I think it's the opposite of getting consent, of bringing about trust, of encouraging people to take themselves seriously, because we are literally having discussions like this, technocratic, would it mean this, does it mean that, should I dot the I or cross the T? That pandemic is one of the things facing this society, as are very many others. And the way we've responded to that pandemic has created a tsunami, a pandemic, of unemployment, of immiseration, of isolation, of the robbing of autonomy and of our freedoms and of our civil liberties. And at the very least, I should be able to say that without the inference being that I have not noticed we're living in a pandemic. I think it's important, and I think also, by the way, many of the local authorities that are now going to higher tiers, there's actually falling rates of coronavirus. Death rates are going down in relation to what they were. So what I'm saying is, is that we're told if only we accept this particular hard measure, all will be well. Well, we've just had a lockdown. We're not even out of it. And now we're being told we're going to have hard tearing and you've got to behave otherwise we won't have Christmas and then at Christmas you've got to be sensible because otherwise you're going to pay for it it's like some sort of religious cult we've entered into and the one thing that nobody discusses is what this does for freedom and democracy in society and I really think that's a very serious price to pay should at least be debated fully we all want to protect the vulnerable but one of the problems with a lot of the lockdown measures and that includes tearing systems is the very people who are being neglected are the vulnerable I mean, you can't visit people in care homes. They are lonely. Mrs Smith in number 16 can't get any visitors. People with dementia in her care homes are dying because they're not being stimulated. They've got no attention. There's, the vulnerable are actually being neglected by our attempts at protecting the vulnerable. And you, you can. People don't have to have Christmas if you don't want to. Feel free. Um, I think that we have to consider what it is we consider to be important about what it means to be alive how we relate to people, what our relationships are like with people. And I think that just seeing it through COVID eyes only means that we neglect the hugely important social aspects of protecting people, of sociability, civility. Young people are having their lives thwarted and you know, people kind of talk about them going out and wanting to go and have a drink as though this is the most irresponsible thing in the world. And then we infantilise people in the process. So my, but because we don't trust them. So when people say about trust, you can't have trust if you then say, but if you break the rules, you'll be fined and you'll be accused of, of, of killing granny. You've got to actually trust people. And that requires a different approach to this. Let's consider what, for example, your you know, fire break lockdown did in Wales to the people who run nail bars, to the hairdressers, to the people whose life savings have been absolutely destroyed, who face bankruptcy, who potentially are gonna lose their homes these people, I mean, nobody deserved to be told that they couldn't make a living. But there's a, as people keep reminding me, a pandemic. And the government brought in certain things. And furlough isn't sufficient. You know, and many public sector workers are actually in a stronger position at the moment than in terms of job security than people in the private sector. Not, you know, the private sector is full of people who actually also were the invisible front line that kept us going. The people who dropped off to those people who enjoy working from home, who dropped off the Amazon, who d the delivery drivers. All of these people deserve pay rises. We all deserve pay rises, but what I'd say is that misses the point. 
And you cannot be in a situation, and I, th I can't understand why the Labour Party haven't worked this bit out. The Labour Party have been calling for stronger, harder, longer, deeper lockdowns since the beginning of this thing. They want to close the economy down and then seem to be shocked that there's an economic crisis Rubbish. that's going to be the greatest facing for not okay. just decades, but for centuries. I think it's been divisive. I don't actually think it's been helpful for the union. I think it's also created a sense of confusion about the United Kingdom myself. I think it's wrong to suggest that if you've got politicians physically closer, um, that they're going to be more in touch with you. Let me assure you, as somebody from North Wales, having the Senate in Cardiff, you know, there is a clique of people around the Senate. That doesn't mean that people in North Wales feel like they're closer. It's, it's a political question, not a physical one. And I think that there's been a huge amount of problems with the Welsh administration. School educational standards have been abysmal under the present administration. I was yesterday in the House of Lords looking at the mental health uh, legislation where, thank goodness, the Coronavirus Act, which gave the power to section people with just one doctor on, and for a long time, which should never have been there in the first place, has been repealed. Wales have kept it on. I mean, don't ask me why, because it's absolutely draconian. We had a, 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 a Mark Drakeford telling us what was essential and inessential shopping. I think the idea that this cup means that you don't care about the global poor um, is uh, a misunderstanding. And I'm not defending the Tories' uh, cut because I actually have got a bigger question about aid anyway. And I always thought that their legislation to have the 0.7% had a, an element of kind of moral grandstanding that I found distasteful. Because I think that the way that you're a global leader is not, and I think it lacks imagination, that we think that it's only through aid. I mean, we need to have and be encouraging countries to develop. I'll tell you what's really hit developing countries at the moment is not this decision to cut the aid budget, but think about the garment workers in Bangladesh and the, the tourism industry in those developing countries. That Western decision in my opinion, to have a disproportionate reaction to coronavirus has devastated their ability to have their own industries, their own autonomy, and so on and so forth. So they're suffering as a consequence of actions we do. And you can't just say, oh, well, aid would have compensated for that, because it wouldn't. But, I mean, their, their, their own governments are also taking action against coronavirus. Yes, but in different ways. But I'm saying, if you look actually at all of the global reports, they'll say that the devastating impact of the West's reaction of stopping people to travel and tourism, as I say, but also the industries. And, you know, if we really want to do something, um, I think that we should have no tariffs on, for example, you know, chocolate coming from Africa, parts of Africa, where there's, you know, in post-Brexit Britain, there are all sorts of ways. In other words, I believe in more trade, not aid, if you want, but encouraging development rather than simply treating people as though they're going to have crumbs off the table of aid. We have to remember as well, you see, it sounds very nice, but aid is quite contentious. It's very political. Aid NGOs are like a big business, right? They're like multinationals, a lot of them are huge. It's not just straightforwardly going to the global poor. So I want to be able to query that, to at least ask questions, to have a complicated and sophisticated conversation, I'm not being funny about it, without people thinking you want to kill off the global poor.